Well, here's a review that I never expected that I'd get to do. Today, we're watching a little-known cartoon short called Cans Without Labels. Now that's a name I've not heard in a long time. Yeah, same here. It was funded by a Kickstarter back in 2012, with a slated release date of February of 2013. It didn't come out until about a week ago, in June of 2019, more than six years later. Although, if you know anything about John Crickfalusi, this might come off as expected. Ah yes, the man of the hour, John K. John Crickfalusi. He was the one behind this Kickstarter and this project. While he was not the only one who worked on it, it's clear that he was the one who called all the shots. The inspiration for this little cartoon came from one of his own personal childhood memories. Now, John K. is known for quite a few things, and let's make no mistake, he is a very very influential person, or at least he used to be. John Kirk Falusi created one of the first three Nicktoons, Ren and Stimpy, and of the three, his was the most popular for quite a while. His work, even more so than the other two Nicktoons, helped shape the creator-driven landscape of the 90s animation, leading to television animation finally becoming interesting and of a consistent high quality. He is a large reason of why the 90s were so interesting. Not only that, but he and his company, Spumco, also made the first webtoon. A lot of people might not know this, but he created the goddamn George Licker program back in 1997, about a full decade before YouTube was even a thing. Hello! I'm George Licker, American! And even before the current incarnation of Newgrounds, John Kay is one of the most influential cartoonists alive. He is also an awful specimen of a human being. There are some of his flaws that I can't ignore. His love of gross-out humor, his penchant for getting things done behind schedule, even him being stuck up his ass about his holier-than-thou opinions. I can even ignore him coining the term CalArch style. But there are some things that I can't ignore. He seems to be one to love creating a hostile work environment. If he's not a misogynist, he's incredibly good at acting like one. And of course, right now, he is under some very severe allegations. He's been accused of manipulation, sexual harassment, child pornography, grooming people, and hebophilia. Call the police. If you want to learn more about these specific allegations, I will link to a video made by Blame It On George, who goes further into this than I am willing to go. What to do here is try and talk about this piece of animation itself. I'm not going to be talking about it as if it was in a vacuum. I don't think there's any merit to doing that, but I want to keep the focus of this review on Cans Without Labels, the cartoon short that he made. 3,500 backers pledged around $136,000 to make this thing happen, of a $110,000 asking price, and I think that that deserves some kind of compensation. Let me start with something very, very clear. I do not look down on anyone who funded this back in 2012, and nobody else should, even knowing what we know about John Kay now. We didn't know for sure about any of these things back then. Even now, there are plenty of people who are still unaware. And yes, I don't look down on anyone who funded this, even knowing that John Kay has a reputation for taking forever on his work. At the time, at least, he seemed to be quite passionate about this specific project. He went on many interviews talking about the memory that sparked this little idea. The project I'm doing right now <coughs> is um, it's a cartoon called Cans Without Labels, and it stars George Licker and two of his nephews, Slab and Ernie. And this is a true story. It's based on a story of when I was a, when I was a kid. So my dad was real cheap, he grew up in the Depression, and he, he would never buy anything for full price, a sticker price, and he wouldn't buy brand label stuff, you know, like, uh, he'd never buy Heinz ketchup. It'd always be like, you know, uh, Vaughn's brand. <laughs> it's very easy to think that this time he'll get it done on time and it'll be amazing. After all, his public reputation is on the line this time around. Ironically enough, it was only when his reputation bottomed out that we'd get to see the end product. And the end product is a piece of poop. Not only that, but one that came out six and a half years late. And my patience for being late with projects ends at a crowdfunding campaign of over $100,000. There is no way in hell that this should have taken this long. For the sake of argument, let's pretend that this is a masterpiece. It isn't, but Let's pretend. Right now, animation vloggers are all over the place on YouTube. It takes about a month for, say, Jaden Animations to make 11 minutes of animation, and the others in that community have a similar time scale. This 11 minutes took six and a half years. But all right, that style of animation is completely different. Ed's World Legacy, an Indiegogo project, earned $83,000 back at a similar time. It only took them four years to get their project done, and they got five episodes and more shorts done. They created over 40 minutes of content, not including the documentaries that they produced. And Ed's World was complete with the works. Coloring, background, voice acting, music, shading. You could put that on TV and it fit right in. 
This here, let's talk about these 11 minutes of animation. Actually, that's the first issue with Cans Without Labels. It's not even 11 minutes. Yes, the time of the video is 11 minutes, but the problem here is that a minute at the start is used for credits, and a minute at the end is used for backer rewards. So that brings us down to nine minutes, but even a nine minute time scale is still an illusion. This cartoon is filled with fluff. It has very long shots of nothing happening. There are plenty of shots with nothing more than a series of stupid faces. And of course, you need to add the requisite dialogue that takes forever. Tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go take a crap. So altogether, I'd have to estimate that there are about five minutes of things actually moving along, which is about less than one minute of animation per year. Well, then again, this was made by a perfectionist, so maybe this is the most perfect thing ever. <laughs> The most perfect thing. <laughs> you, you, you're trolling, right? Just from what I've shown you, you probably noticed plenty of flaws yourself. First of all, this is in a 4 3 aspect ratio. I don't know why. Yes, 90s cartoons were in a 4 3 aspect ratio, which is why you have the black bars on the sides when you upload them to a place like YouTube, but standards change over time. Everyone, and I mean everyone uses 16 by 9 now. That's pretty much the default in most animation programs. That's not just a television standard, it's an internet standard too, it's an everyone standard. It's not like John K doesn't know how to animate in 16 by 9. Hell, the backer rewards are in a 16 by 9 ratio, which means that the video is always going to have these sidebars, no matter where it's uploaded. Maybe to give them the benefit of the doubt, it's a stylistic choice. You know, an attempt to invoke the aspects of the 90s. But this this is absolutely not the way you do it. When you bring back an older decade, you only bring back the good aspects, our positive pieces of it. Not things like technical limitations. The people who wanted to see 90s animation like this would probably love to see 90s animation in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. If you want a direct comparison, look at Cuphead. People love it because it took 30s animation and did with it what we can do today with our technology. And it left behind the unflattering parts of 1930s animation that nobody wants around anymore. Then there are the facial expressions themselves. I've actually wanted to make a little rant about this for quite a while by now, because this is something that's been really been bothering me about internet animation in general. Tons and tons of internet animators have come to the conclusion that stupid faces equals jokes. Like, all the time, when you're watching a parody of Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or whatever, what they'll do is not have any jokes besides needless profanity. They'll just bring up a reference from the show and make this distorted face. I don't bring this up though, and I don't review these because these are guys just hobbyists doing what they love. They're technically amateurs, but all the power to them to do this. I'd recommend they not do that, but they can if they want to. No one's their boss, they can do whatever they want. So can you please tell me why an animation veteran who has been in the industry for over 20 years is doing what amateurs do? Ren and Stimpy was definitely known for its bizarre facial expressions, so I can see where the logic comes from. But let's start with the very, very basic. There were other types of jokes in Ren and Stimpy. Ren bashing his face in with a hammer isn't funny because he's making faces doing it. It's funny because he's bashing his face in with a hammer. The facial expressions enhance the other jokes. Stupid faces are basically the only type of humor that we get here. The other problem here is that the animation on the characters kind of fluctuates way too much. Like, in one frame it'll be one expression, then in the next frame it'll be another expression even with a different body position, all mashed together. We have in-betweens and smears for a reason. It makes me think that the only reason that Ren and Stimpy look decent is because the limited technology of the time prevented them from filling every single frame with crap. The timing in this short is completely off, so not a single joke lands. The this actually reminds me of another project. That's something that failed to get a laugh in most people because the jokes took forever to get to the point, because there was just too much fluff in it. They had to reach a specific time uh, for a grade, because that was made by college students as a final presentation, and it was made for free, in the time span of a college semester. Cans Without Labels was made by a professional who had $130,000 to work with over six and a half years. Then there are times when the animation doesn't want to animate. Ooh, that face better be gone. You saw that, right? What happened was that George Licker was drawn once, and then that drawing was slid across the room. You know, for someone who hated the animation industry in the 70s and 80s so much, I'm honestly intrigued that he'd use their techniques verbatim. I'm actually getting a lot of joy when I say this, uh, but Hanna-Barbera animation is better than this John Crick Falusi animation. At least Hanna-Barbera had an excuse. They barely broke even with their cartoons, and they needed to get animation out fast. Once again, 
I know I'm reiterating a lot, but this cost $130,000 and took six years to make. There's a difference between drawing art and animation. If The Simpsons is a show made by writers that can't draw, Cancel That Labels is made by an artist that can't animate. You'll also notice that there's a lot of CGI in this short. I have no idea why. From what I understand, John Kay hated CGI and had some choice words to say about it. And if you're funding a John Kay production, wouldn't you want the entire thing to be hand-drawn? I mean, the CGI in this is just used for tables, the cans, in the chairs. It's not much, but it still gives a very weird effect. Like, if you play this side by side with the amazing world of Gumball, you'll see the problem. The drawn characters in Gumball are really integrated into the world around them with things like clever lighting and camera work. Counts Without Labels shows you exactly what can go wrong. These characters all look like cardboard cutouts uh, when the CGI gets involved. Speaking of that, the worst part of this animation is the camera control. There's a lot of panning here by a guy who does not know how to pan the camera in animation. Look at the very first shot of this. As the camera pans backward, George Licker's nose noticeably gets smaller. It is very noticeable. Excuse me if I don't know this Mr. Animation expert, uh, but isn't perspective one of the fundamentals of not just animation, but drawing in general. No, I suppose it isn't. All you need is a CGI table and a computer to do it for you. Look at how awful this looks. The panning doesn't look natural at all because George's size and shape doesn't move along with it. Instead, it makes it look like the table is growing and shrinking and moving of its own accord. Not helping is the background, or the lack of backgrounds for that matter. And yes, Ren and Stimpy had a very similar style when it came to backgrounds, but that's kind of why they don't work here. To quote the man himself once again, I influenced the background style by not being able to draw perspective. The background artist developed cool graphic painting styles to make my bad backgrounds look like they were that way on purpose. This is kind of why a lot of these crowdfunders by quote-unquote auteurs turn out to be incredibly bad or at least disappointing. It's because things like video games, and especially animation, they're not made by one-man teams. John Kirk Falusi may have created Ren and Stimpy, but he was not the reason that it was good, or at the very least, he was not the only reason. He had a team behind him. And if there's one thing that's really starting to pee me off, it's the kind of, I'm the only one who made this collaborative project a success attitude. I mean, if you want to know one of the reasons that Ren and Stimpy was so good, look up Bob Camp. He was a developer, he did the story, he was a storyboard artist, a writer, a director, a producer, a supervising director, a creative director, and voice actor on John Crick Falusi's Ren and Stimpy. You want to see what a cartoon looks like with only one person working on it? Well, it's not even this, because even something like this required a team. A one-man team looks like Patty the Pelican. That's what you get when you try to do this on your own. Not to put myself on a moral high ground or anything, but yes, even though I am the creator of my own series, it would never be where it is today without the help of other people, and a lot of them. Growing around requires talented artists, script readers, a music producer, and we're still looking for more people. But I'm not even talking about that. Even something as simple as animated atrocities. It's not just me who made this what it is. Things like this would not be possible without my editors or the people around me just giving me some direction towards an interesting show to talk about or insight on a script. Do you think I drew my own avatar? No, I didn't. And I didn't draw my last one either. The one I did draw looks like shit. Auteurs don't stand on the shoulders of giants as they'd like to claim. They are the giants. And the bigger they are, the more people that they're held up by. Universally. Each and every single one of them would be useless left on their own. The sound effects and cans without labels bring you right back to the 90s. Well, I guess we're having a face for lunch. That's because I've heard these exact ones back in the 90s. Like, these are literally the ones that you'll hear in the original Ren and Stimpy and in Spongebob. They're stock sound effects, and you know, that that alone doesn't bug me too much. After all, this thing only pulled it in $130,000. You gotta save money somewhere, right? The problem is this. You'll hear this exact sound effect no less than three times in these 11 minutes. I am starting to miss Johnny Test's whip crack, to be totally honest with you. The whip crack lasts, what, a fraction of a second? Meanwhile, these dramatic impacts, they last full seconds, which is in incredibly noticeable. And that's not the only issue that I've noticed in the sound department. What's wrong with the face? Perfectly good face. You should look that good. Do you know how many starving African babies would kill for a nice face like this, do you? So this line was put together from two separate takes. They took the first words from one take and the rest of them from another take, and they barely tried to disguise it. I noticed this because sometimes I have to do that, but that's because I'm trying to stay on top of the YouTube's algorithms. I need to meet a deadline. And even then, I try to make it sound coherent. Cancel That Labels was in production for six years. I think you had time to make another take. 
Oh, and of course, because this is an internet cartoon, we need to have some needless profanity. Wow! It's Donald Bastard! TV personality! Oh, did I mention that John K. doesn't like Disney? Uh, because he doesn't like Disney. Actually, funny story. The Kalar style, as he coined it, didn't refer to things like bean smiles. No, what it referred to were animators trying to opt Disney styles. So, not only are the people who use the Kalar's complaint aping an alleged statutory rapist, they are misusing what the complaint was actually about. This thing does like to shove asses in my face a bit too much, but beyond that, it's surprisingly tame in terms of gross out, especially for a John K. production. The whole thing is about the face that they're supposed to eat, but the face doesn't even really look that gross. I've seen pudding skins that look more disgusting. Hell, it doesn't even look like a face. You want to know a really, really sad thing? When people got tired of waiting for this thing to come out, uh, they put together a bunch of storyboards with their voices. Think along the lines of the recobbled cut of the Thief and the Cobbler. That unfinished version was better than this final product. If you want to see what John Crick Felucci can animate given creative freedom, well, don't watch this, watch the Weird Al Close But No Cigar video. It's much better than this because he probably had people around him to tell him, no, this is actually how you're supposed to do that. If you do it that way, it will come out awful. Yes, things were too restrictive in the 80s, but some restrictions are important because we need to create a cohesive product. And Cans Without Labels is not cohesive. I mean, it, it's cohesive garbage. If this was just a terrible product, though, that would be one thing. But no, what really does peeve me off, why I made this video, is that this took six years, seven years actually, and $130,000 of other people's money. People who looked up to John Crick Falusi. For full disclosure, I did not back this. I don't like John K's actual work in general, so I wouldn't have been interested even if I had the disposable income at the time, but that doesn't matter. Crowdfunding has a rock bottom reputation because people like to blame those who had their money swindled instead of the charlatans that swindled them. I think it's time to put an end to that. Oh, and before I go, Butch, Oaxis better be the best damn network that I've ever seen, Christian or not. I am holding you to that. Remember, Proverbs 12.22, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy.